is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo have had a long history of tensions stemming back to the mid-1990s. After the Rwandan genocide ended in 1994, Rwanda and Ugandan armed forces invaded the Eastern DRC in 1996 in an effort to root out the remaining perpetrators of the genocide. Now, over the last few decades, the two countries have gone through further turbulent periods. In 2008, the DRC and Rwanda joined forces to root out the FDLR, or inter Ahamwe rebels, in South and North Kivu provinces. In the last few weeks, tensions have again risen in the Great Lakes region after the DRC and Rwanda accused each other of supporting rebel groups hostile to the other. Now, this week on the program, we take a look at the history of the tensions in the region and what has caused it to reignite. We also look at some possible long-term solutions to the problem. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, fighting has erupted in the last few weeks in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, causing thousands to flee from their homes. Before we begin our discussion, we take a look at the humanitarian impact of the conflict in the region. My colleague Leon Sinyange brings us more from Kampala. Authorities estimate that hundreds of refugees have entered the country through the Nagana border post in western Uganda over the weekend. The latest influx of refugees follows renewed fighting between M23 rebels and the Congolese government soldiers. The situation in Congo is still very fragile. Uh, there are still fightings and people are still coming in to Uganda. Some are not here, others are in the host communities. Now, that situation has been evolving for the last three months. So far, over 30,000 Congolese refugees have been registered at Nyakabande Refugee Transit Camp in Kisoro since the conflict started last November. It is some comfort for the new arrivals for now, but there remains a dire need for basic amenities. They have to eat daily, to have breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then we also have those ones who are malnourished because they come malnourished from DRC and we have a blanket supplementary feeding. So as the uh, food items are going high, there's an issue of food support, which is a call to the donors. Uganda currently hosts over 1.5 million refugees. The current crisis is already stretching relief efforts. The focus is not only Kisoro. We have some ongoing emergency in Palabek, in Ajumani, in Kasese, in Bubukonga, Bujibojo. Please, I think that the solution is more resources. Humanitarian agencies continue to worry that the fighting between the M23 and the DRC government will soon worsen. The Democratic Republic of Congo has accused a neighbor's Rwanda of supporting the rebel activities. Rwanda has denied that. The Uganda army says it is monitoring its border to ensure its territory is safe. Calls to calm the tension between the two warring factions have unfortunately yielded nothing. Yet, the Eastern DRC crisis remains a major issue in the region. Leon Sanyange, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. Well, joining me now to unpack the tensions between Rwanda and the DRC are from Accra, Kambale Musevuli, Congolese human rights activist and analyst with the Center for Research on the Congo, from Kigali, Professor Ismail Buchanan, Senior Lecturer in Political Science at the University of Rwanda. And from Cape Town, Daniel Van Dalen, Africa-focused analyst at Signal Risk, a South African-based company that specializes in risk management on the African continent. Gentlemen, thank you and welcome uh, to the program. Uh, Kambale and Professor Buchanan, let me start off with you first because uh, we'd like to get an understanding of what the situation is between the DRC and Rwanda because relations between Rwanda and uh, Congo have been fraught for decades. What is this latest flare-up about? I think this is, uh, you need to look at uh, different perspective from the past uh, 
period, especially uh, let's look at the 20 years ahead during the 1994 genocide, whereby uh, those militians, especially in Herahamwe and those ex far who are in Rwanda, you know, they cross, uh, they have been uh, welcomed in DRC at that time being the uh, Zaire. And uh, most of uh, those ex Interham who even committed genocide in Rwanda against Tutsi in 1994, the time they arrived in the DRC, they could not be disarmed or de demobilized, let's may, I can say that. So at that time, you can see that some of them, they have even uh, accused of violation with the human rights uh, issues like uh, rape and so on to the Congolese people. At the same time, uh, also, we can even take the side of uh, the new uh, rebels to, to call it the M. Ventura, call it uh, the DRC is calling them a terrorist group, which right. we need to also to understand what, if it's a terrorist group or if they are fighting for their, their rights in Congo, which you need to find out. And this thing has been, uh, and almost, almost you remember that in the Kenya uh, dialogue between the East African community, especially head of state, whereby they are looking at, uh, because of the conflict in DRC, that uh, East African countries can come together to make sure they fight with uh, all armed groups in the RSC, you know, the so, tensions is high and the, all those things. I'm going so to interrupt those... you there, so uh, Professor Buchanan, because I also want to get Kambale's view on what he thinks uh, has caused the latest flare up. We do understand that there's been continuous conflicts between, you know, uh, you know the, the Eastern uh, DRC for the last uh, uh, 20 or so years, but what has caused uh, this latest flare up, uh, Kambale? The latest flare uh, is direct. Uh, but for the past six months, the M23 has started a, an attack on UN peacekeeper, uh, peacekeeping forces and the Congolese army. The backdrop of the attacks to the Congolese army and the UN peacekeepers is that at the current moment, there are peace negotiations in Nairobi with many of the rebel groups there. The M23 decided to leave those peace talks and decided to launch an attack. Now, what we have noticed uh, for the past month or so is that the military power of the M23 has increased tremendously. Uh, they have the capacity now to fight at night, which simply means that they have now night vision, goggles, and equipment, something that cannot easily just be gotten in the Congolese forest. Um, beyond that, in some of the areas where they were attacked, uh, they left some of their weapons. They had very sophisticated weapons. And lately, uh, in the past uh, few days, uh, with the UN drones, uh, it was documented that Rwandan soldiers have actually crossed the border and are operating in the DRC. So let me bring back uh, Professor Buchanan here, because you've heard from um, Kambale talking about Rwandan soldiers operating in the DRC. Professor Buchanan, what do we know here? And I, I think those are the accusation from the DRC side by kissing Rwanda, sending special force in distinguished to the country territory. And so far, they have never any kind of fact and proof that uh, uh, soldiers of Rwanda are in DRC, except uh, the way you have uh, seen like the two soldiers, even the junior soldiers, who has been even, uh, we cannot even say that they have been in, 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 in DRC territory as far as uh, the, the, the spokesman of the government of Rwanda, especially Rwanda arms spokesperson, has explained very clear how, how they have been kidnapped. And you have seen that even recently that uh, with the uh, Angola uh, president, the way they have, uh, you know, re returned to Rwanda safely by making sure because of dialogue between Rwanda and the DRC. And I think those accusations, that what has making even the escalation uh, to allege that because of those presence in the Rwandese army in the RRC, and uh, that's how even can look at how increase the tension anti Rwandese Kenya Rwanda speaking, especially when we are referring to M23 who speak Kenya Rwanda, and especially with those Congolese. So all those accusations has really alarmed and increased the tension to say that uh, Rwanda is backing the M M M23, all which right. is uh, which is the government has really make it clear that uh, that is a wrong and false accusation from the side of the DRC. Kambale, d d does the DRC have any um, evidence uh, on those reports as, as put for forward by Professor Buchanan? And again, Kambale, what exactly are the concerns of the DRC in this situation? The concerns of the DRC is simple. I mean, Congo has been in turmoil for now 
uh, 25 years, where, as I mentioned before, Congo's neighbors have affected the security and stability of the Congo. Uh, it is a fact that Rwanda and Uganda have invaded the Congo twice, in 96 and 98, and have continued uh, to support proxy rebel militias. Numerous UN reports exist documenting uh, the same thing. Why is there a conflict in the Congo? It's really for access of Congo's mineral wealth, uh, documenting many different reports. Uh, this is just the latest let expression of that. All right. I'm going to drop in Daniel here because, Daniel, you have listened to both sides, uh, the arguments from both uh, the DRC and, uh, and Rwanda, you know, and, and the fallout in 1998, you know, that if we go back there, that triggered a war in the DRC, which dragged in about nine African countries and a dozen or so militia armed groups. How is this latest flare-up, though, affecting the stability of the Great Lakes region? And what are the region's concerns? And what are your thoughts on what you've heard from the DRC and the Rwandi side? So from a regional standpoint, I think it's very much contained right now, as you've, as they both, the two gentlemen have said before, you know, it is a very much a regional thing and the Congo war saw the involvement of many of the Great Lakes regions. Um, you know, for example, Burundi is still has troops in uh, South Kivu province, busy fighting my, my militant groups there. Um, you know, Rwanda has undertaken clandestine operations in DRC to track down Hutu extremist groups sanctioned by, you know, DRC over the years. Um, you know, there have been joint efforts in recent years to kind of address these issues. Um, so I think in terms of the current standoff between Rwanda and DRC, it's isolated for now. We've seen the EAC not particularly take a specific side on the matter. Um, it's very neutral. We saw, um, you know, their general secretary said a few days ago to say, well, the crisis, you know, don't over panic, it's going to be settled. We've seen the AU call for um, an immediate summit on the matter. So in terms of wider regional stability, I think the region has always been a little bit fragile since the Congo wars. There's obviously been multiple attempts to, um, you know, improve relations. We've seen attempts by Rwanda now to do it with Burundi, with um, Uganda, you know, when Chizikedi came to power in 2019, we also saw a big drive from him to try and improve relations, you know, which we actually did see a warming of relations between Rwanda and DRC until the recent crisis. Um, so I think because of what we've seen over the past years, I don't think this specific incident poses a widespread security risk to the wider region. You know, and I do think there is hope within the region, specifically the EAC, that this will be resolved and they'll be able to bring Kagami and Chizikedi to the table um, to, to kind of rectify the situation. Daniel, are we seeing some sort of different, uh, difference in approach, though, between um, how uh, former President Kabila handled uh, such flare-ups and in the way that President Tishik Sekedi is handling the security situation in the eastern DRC? You know, over the years, the, the Congolese government under, you know, Kabila, we, we saw the, tr I mean, I think a key example, even if you look at M23 uprising in 2012, 2013, you know, how that ended was, you know, an agreement, a demobilization, disarmament program, and that fundamentally failed. Um, you know, we saw mass defections over the years that followed. And, you know, it wasn't just M23 that it didn't work out. Multiple attempts at, at peace summits have failed over the years because I can, one can argue lack of political will, there's been a lack of financing, um, you know, lack of community support. So I do think that if we look at the initiation of the Nairobi peace talks in April, that is probably the, a, a striking contrast to what's been attempted previously. Um, but once, you know, DLC entered the EAC in around March, uh, we started seeing pressure and at the same time obviously there was this flare-up in conflict with m23 we saw pressure from the united nations and the eac to try you know a different approach and this is how um you know the nairobi talks effectively came a uh, bit of a mixed bag in the first round but a lot of groups did agree to start participating uh, the approach by the government has been different this time around right um, which has seen a couple of po positive developments there's a big community focus so even groups that didn't attend the first round um, they have now been engaged in community workshops facilitated by the UN and the government. It's a much more holistic approach to what's been done previously. There's also a lot more um, foreign support. So there's a lot of funding from the World Bank. Um, the EAC is now obviously officially involved. The UN's more involved. They're facilitating the meetings. All right. Let me let me hear from Kambala here before we go to the break, because uh, Kambala, we're hearing much about this M23. And, you know, although the war was declared over in 2003, Eastern DRC still remains extremely uh, volatile. 
who exactly is this M23 and what exactly are their goals? The M23 is a web of force. The acronym is March 2030. March uh, 23rd of 2009, uh, a rebel group called the CNDP uh, signed a peace accord with the Congolese army to integrate the Congolese army. Uh, in 2012, they decided to leave the Congolese army and launch an attack stating that uh, the accord, uh, the agreement they said with the Congolese government was not respected. But whenever it's spoken just lightly uh, in this context, you get confused about who they are because that's not really the reason why uh, they decided to fight in 2012. I mean, the reason why well, evidence that exists, uh, including the reports that were published at the time, was that one of their leaders, Bosco Tanganda, uh, was being threatened for an arrest uh, to go to the ICC. And during the time where there was so much pressure on the Congolese uh, government to arrest Bosco Tanganda, the M23, uh, the loyalists of Bosco Tanganda went into the bush and created a new branding of their rebel group. Now that I've mentioned CNDP, uh, the CNDP is another acronym of a rebel group, but it's not the first one, right? Before the CNDP, they were called the RCD. Before that, they were called the AFDL. That's the same rebel force that simply changed their names and these four entities being one have always been backed, armed, trained, and equipped by the Rwandan government. It got even worse that uh, they were commanded by James Kabarebe, a general in the Rwandan uh, army, that has actually pushed the, the American government. In 2012, when they were putting pressure on the CN uh, on the M23, right. the US government, after receiving the evidence that Rwanda was backing the M23, revealed financial aid. I will put that question to Professor Buchanan when we come from the break. For now, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll look at some possible long-term solutions to the tensions in the Great Lakes. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me are Kambale Musevuli, Professor Ismail Buchanan, and Daniel Van Dalin. Before the break, we looked at the history of the DRC Rwanda tensions. Let's now look at some long-term solutions here. Professor Buchanan, you've heard uh, Kambale's position on what is going on in the Eastern D DRC regarding the militia there. What is the position of the Rwandan government, though, on those allegations of funding and financing the militia in Eastern DRC? I think you have hear from the government authorities, starting from the authorities, starting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Rwanda Army spokesperson, including in even other uh, Rwandan authority, that. Uh, uh, you hear that uh, those kind of accusation, even the same before even I do that, let's be even at least to what uh, you are even talking about before that, what is M23 to make sure that uh, many people should understand what is all about because this you cannot authentically accept that because uh, he heard that Kabarebe, who is a general, has said this Kabarebe is not the one to authenticate the M23. I think M23 they are there due to the historical background, which you need to understand. They are with the historical past of. Of colonialism, you know how many Rwandese, and you know how with this kind of Berlin, eh, the scramble of Africa, how they have divided Africa into two different places. There are some people who may, eh, during the, the, the borders, before even you get independence in Rwanda and even Congo. So you remember the historic background on how this, some of when Rwanda were part of the Congo. So accusing M23, uh, backing like they are in Rwanda. No, speaking in Rwanda, it does not give them automatically to that one. Even the UN has failed to, to make sure come up to the tangible thing. So let's not use a, a fiction thing to come to the concrete ones. And uh, as far as the DR, is concerned, you know, they are fighting the area whereby there is lots of minerals. So why can't we F, allow FDR to use those minerals? Why not the M23? They, are, they have guns, they can fight and use those kind of minerals and export them and they sell it. So I think they are getting everything from the DRC because DRC has the whole thing. But what they need to do is make sure 
the weak government which is there, the weak politician who are there has to interrogate and a dialogue with the M23. Otherwise, the M23 is getting whatever they want. Daniel, is there hypocrisy here of the international community? Because the UN's peacekeeping mission has been in DR Congo since 1999. It is one of the biggest peacekeeping operations in the world. I mean, 20,000 personnel are on the ground, yet it is unable to quell the violence in the DRC. Why? Well, listen, I think there's, there's a couple of factors for that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the militant violence, yes, we can stem it from the Congo Wars and, you know, regional dynamics and all of those things. But I think, you know, there's always going to be a motivation for, you know, these types of actors, um, you know, in a context or in, in an economic context where, you know, there's not many opportunities for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, if you look at the actual vast distance of the entire Northeast geopolitical zone, um, you know, the dense jungle, um, you know, the distance between localities, the ability for groups, for large groups to regroup and move and, you know, you know, the, the communal components, the ethnic components, it's very difficult, even with that troop size, to manage, you know, the geography like that. I mean, if you look at the Congolese forces, they have over 100,000 troops, you know, and it's a similar outcome. So, you know, and at the end of the day, they're always going to be isolated little groups. And, you know, they will pose very localized threats to, to communities. But, you know, you will always have the big things like the Islamic State aligned, you know, ADF extremist movement, which are, which is a huge player in terms of contributing to insecurity in North Kivu and Ituri province. You know, you'll have the myriad Mai Mai militias, self-defense groups in South Kivu. Um, you know, each, each province also has its own dynamic in that sense. Right. And I think the failure to address that has literally been that Previously, it's always just been a once all, let's go in guns blazing and see what we can do, but that's never worked. And I think that's why you're seeing the new strategy now supported by the UN, um, you know, and supported by the EAC to try and adopt a different approach. Yes, I suppose one could argue there is a hypocrisy to try and do this now, um, but I suppose, yeah, I think they've now just seen it's not working. Kambale, I'll start off with you. What do you th think needs to be done for a long-term solution in this uh, DR crisis? Your winding up comments. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the DRC, I think I mentioned before, and this, I uh, appreciate Professor Buchanan uh, sharing the point of dialogue. And I think for peace and stability in the Great Lakes region, uh, it has to start with dialogue inside of Rwanda. Uh, he has hinted at FDLR. Uh, FDLR uh, Rwandans who are in the, uh, in the DRC. Uh, they should go home. Uh, they should participate in a political process in Rwanda, and there should be some form of dialogue there. Uh, the second thing that should happen uh, to bring peace and stability in the region is the question of political prisoners in Rwanda. For example, Paul Rosas Abegina, uh, who is in Rwanda right now, who was actually kidnapped and is a prisoner there. The instability within Rwanda of uh, political prisoners, of journalists who are being arrested, of uh, Rwanda Hutus who are in the Congolese forest who need to go home uh, can only happen there. So if the FDLR are able to return home, Congo can deal with its problems. And specifically for the M23, uh, as we discussed, they have to put down the guns. The exclusion was direct. As soon as they picked up the gun, you can negotiate with someone who have the guns at the table. They need to put down the guns and come to the table. And the external support of the rebel groups uh, in the Congo needs to stop because it only exacerbates the solution. So when we look at all those things, dialogue in Rwanda, Rwandan refugees returning in, the, uh, in Rwanda, making sure that political prisoners in Rwanda, such as Paul Rusisa Begina and others, are free and can participate in a political process in Rwanda. Pressure on the M23 to return to the dialogue by stopping actually uh, the, right. the support of external forces, those elements will bring about regional peace uh, for the uh, decades to come. All right, Professor Buchanan, your thoughts? Thank you so much. And I appreciate what my brother is talking about. I think dialogue is the most key. We need always to put together. But let me remind him that uh, Poro Cesar Gina was not kidnapped. Poro Cesar Gina accepted himself what he committed, almost this out of the 13 crime has committed almost a six or seven has adopted has accepted to support to sponsor even the that kind of people who are doing with including all those sankaras so i think when it comes to those uh, uh, i mean hutus you are referring to i think rwanda has always fight for that to make sure that 
anyone who is in Munyarwanda should return. You know, you have so many cases, you know, people who come from the FDRR who really has put the guns and come back. So I don't think uh, if we are talking about dialogue, we are going to accept that one is one these people to accept FDRR with the guns and supporting with the backing with those countries we are talking about to come to Rwanda. I think what you have to do, the, the, the DRC government must make sure that it demor demoralize and destabilize those kind of thing which comes to FDRR and ask them to put the gun down. And at the same time, those who committed the genocide must make sure they go by sure to the justice. Otherwise, every Munyarwanda without any discrimination, ethnicity or whatever, we don't count this kind of ethnicity in Rwanda. We consider as a, every Munyarwanda who really committed to support and to come and build this nation. But I support that the dialogue between DRC with its people and at the same time to to dialogue when it comes to anti-Rwanda demonstration must stop and this because it's always violated the violence then this kind of m23 must also sit with drc people the government to sit and the dialogue and come out to the consensus of coming to the peace otherwise without dialogue without that kind of diplomatic dialogue right. then we are not talking anything about that all right it's daniel just... very briefly i want to hear your view on what you think needs to be done for a long-term solution very briefly you know, I, I, I personally don't think it's just a Rwanda DRC thing. I think it has to be a regional thing, given the historic component of it. Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi and DRC all need to come together and actually find a long lasting solution to this. I do think a big part of it will be the dialogue processes in DRC that are unfolding now are going to be a huge step for that. Um, I think as you can start getting more and more groups demobilized, which, you know, the Congo government has done a new approach to it. Um, you know, there is a little bit of enthusiasm towards this new approach to it. And I think once you can start just arming more and more groups, you can start looking at the more core groups that are contributing to insecurity in the region. Um, you know, you also at the same time, you also can't look at, well, let's fight insecurity, but you also have governments that are still in the process of reproachment efforts, such as Rwanda and Burundi, Rwanda and Uganda, DRC and the rest. You know, I think there needs to be a two stage thing where the governments need to come together and sort their issues out through a dialogue process mediated by either the EA, EAC or the African Union. And then you also have to have a separate component about the armed groups, because at the end of the day, the armed groups and their actions are contributing to the tensions that you see between the countries. Um, yeah, so I don't think you can just say, well, DRC and Rwanda need to sort the, each other's out alone. Um, yeah, it needs to be a group effort. And I think the Nairobi talks at present are promising. And I think that, you know, if the tensions between DRC and Rwanda can be addressed, um, you know, the talks at present do have some sort of opportunity for what we're looking for in terms of stability in the region. All right, gentlemen, a very interesting discussion indeed, very insightful. But that's all we have time on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to all our guests, Kambale Musavuli, Congolese human rights activist and analyst with the Center for Research on the Congo. Professor Ismail Buchanan, senior lecturer in political science at the University of Rwanda and Daniel Van Dalin, Africa-focused analyst at uh, Signal Risk South Africa. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. And do also catch the show on our YouTube playlist. Keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, stay safe and bye-bye.